Hey guys, uh, this time around, I'm going to do something a little bit different for me anyway. I'm just going to show one book and one CD. Um, the first thing I'm going to show is the book. Um, it's uh, based, well, it's a book about the Indian and the Hindu culture. Uh, you know, my whole adult life, I've been very interested, of course, in their music, but, you know, in their culture. Anything to do with India is very fascinating to me. Their mythology, uh, all this, you know, the words like karma, uh, you know, Shiva, Upanishads, Rig Veda. Uh, I just know a little bit about all these things. Um, hopefully this book will help me understand it more completely. Uh, it's quite a thick book, uh, about 700 pages. Uh, there it is right here. Uh, it's called The Hindus, An Alternative History by Wendy Doniger. Uh, I just randomly, you know, pick up chapters right now. I haven't read the uh, book, you know, in chronological order. I just picked and choose a few things I want to uh, just, you know, absorb right away and get inspired by it. Uh, there's so many images that, you know, conjures up, but it's about uh, reading the stuff, the, the mythology itself, uh, and the facts and figures are also very amazing. Um, actually, there's a, there's a story in here uh, by a Sufi, Nasruddin, which I want to start off reading that little story. It's called Searching for the Key. Someone saw Nasruddin searching for something on the ground. What have you lost, Mullah? He asked. My key, said the Mullah. So they both went down on their knees and looked for it. After a time, the other man asked, where exactly did you drop it? In my own house, he said. Then why are you looking for it here? His answer was, there was more light here than inside my own house. So anytime you're looking for something, you might be looking in the wrong place. Yeah, but this book is really, uh, you know, interesting and inspiring. Uh, I think anybody uh, will enjoy this, uh, especially people who love, you know, everybody loves Indian music, I think, out there. Um, I really haven't seen much scanning through it about the music aspect of the Hindus or the Indian culture, but I'm sure there's something buried in here about the music also. I also was lucky to find this recently uh, on Peter Gabriel's Real World label. This is a soundtrack from the uh, movie called The Mahabharata. Um, it features musicians from Turkey, Iran, Japan, and France. I haven't listened to it yet, but I'm sure it's really good. Uh, that's a great, that's a Ganesha, the elephant-headed god. Um, this on the back, that's, if you can see, that's actually a photograph of magnified elephant skin. Yeah, Peter... Peter Gabriel's Real World uh, label has some great world music. Uh, you know, most of it's recorded uh, in, the 90, in the late 80s, 90s. Good stuff. Uh, the compact disc I'm going to show uh, is very, very uh, intriguing to me on so many different levels. Uh, it's a great introduction to modern classical music so-called avant-garde music. Uh, it's a great introduction to anybody who's interested in knowing that doesn't know much about that style of music. Uh, but it's also great for a connoisseur of the music because it's, it operates at all different levels. Um, it's all piano music by uh, a piano player from Italy, born in 1964. His name is Marino Formenti. The uh, title of the album is Nothing Is Real. That's uh, a composition by Alvin Lucier, which is uh, it's the uh, title track. Um, if you notice, the album cover is you know kind of like user-friendly strawberries. Uh, you know, so it kind of has a welcoming feel. It's not going to be too out there. Um, so. Uh, and like I said, anybody who, who wants to know what avant-garde modern music sounds like, this is a perfect uh, primer for anybody like that out there. Uh, I'm going to discuss um, 
some of the compositions on here, not all of them. Um, interesting to me is maybe two of the composers on here I have never heard of before until I bought this. Uh, the other guys are pretty well known to me. Uh, the first composer that I never knew of is Beat Fiora. I uh, was born in 1954. Uh, I'm gonna say he's from Austria. He's I knew him from um, not as a composer, but he's the uh, head of an ensemble from Vienna called the Clang Forum. Um, if you see any albums or CDs with the Clang Forum Vienna ensemble on it, the chances are it's gonna be a fantastic uh, musical adventure. But he's, you know, he's also a composer. Um, his piece is called uh, Voicelessness. The voice has no, the, the snow has no voice, which voicelessness, the snow has no voice, uh, which is actually uh, taken from a poem by Sylvia Plath called The Munich Mannequins, which is actually, I read the poem. It's actually a really good poem by Sylvia Plath, yes. Uh, he studied with another composer that's on here, uh, Ramon Haberstock Ramadi. He's another guy I never heard of until I bought this. Um, but yeah, Beat Fiora, um, his piece, it, it's, it's a quiet, uh, very minimal sounding piece. Um, sort of like Harold Budd, Eric Satie, a debut Z kind of feel to it. Um, very, very meditative and be you know, beautiful. And um, like every piece on the CD, the sound is incredibly engineering on here. It's spectacular. Each note fades away. You can hear the uh, note decay beautifully. Uh, you know, so the sound throughout this CD is spectacular. That really makes it, uh, you know, uh, uh, A plus sounding. And uh, the you know compositions playing everything gets an A plus, especially the sound. Um, the other uh, composer that I never knew of until I saw his name other places, but never heard it, any of his stuff. Another Italian guy, Salvatore Schiarino. Uh, he was born in 1947. Um, his piece. Uh, there's two pieces by him on here. Um, one of them is uh, written when he met uh, Luigi Nono, the composer. He was good friends with him. Um, when Luigi Nono was dying, uh, Salvatore went to go visit him on his deathbed. And they had a you know intimate conversation. So this opposition was inspired by the meeting he had with uh, Luigi Nono as he was dying. Um, I think it's called Lost in the City of... Yeah, Lost in the City of Water. Of course, it took place in Venice. That's another fantastic, um, you know, quiet, meditative piece. You know, kind of similar to the Beat Fiora piece, but a little bit different. Um, it's not really somber, as you would imagine, from a deathbed conversation. Uh, but it's, you know, it's just peaceful. Again, the sounds decay, the notes decay beautifully, uh, the sustain, uh, sound is fantastic. Uh, his other piece, uh, is, is a nocturne, subtitled, uh, Rage, comma, Metal, M-E-T-A-L. It's very loud and boisterous. It's a three-minute short piece, but it's very loud. Uh, it's, it's probably the loudest thing on here. A little bit different than everything else on there, but it's very entertaining also. Uh, the other, the other um, uh, composer that I never heard of before is a guy named Georg Frederick Haas uh, from Austria. He's a very interesting character. Um, his, his piece here uh, is a tribute to uh, Georgi Leggetti, another composer. It's for two pianos tuned a quarter note apart. 
The uh, pianos are placed at right angles to each other. Um, it's kind of a, a mechanic. It almost sounds like a player piano, like a mechanical piano. It's very, uh, you know, uh, uh, repetitive. There's Marino playing two pianos. Um, it's it's a very physical piece. Must be very tiring to play this something like this. Um, but you know, it's it's not uh, crazy. It, it just has a simple pounding rhythm. But the overtones between the two uh, pianos interface with uh, with each other it creates some beautiful uh, uh, sonorities that are really unexpected and beautiful. Uh, but it's it's a it's a great piece. Uh, George Frederick Haas is an interesting character. Uh, his personal life, he's actually um, married to an African American woman. They're in uh, an alternative lifestyle, uh, master submissive type thing, master slave, where she's his servant basically. Um, she's actually uh, now a sex therapist. She was born in a housing project in Harlem, New York City. And uh, George was born in a little town in uh, Austria, you know, in the Alps. So a picture of an uh, uh, African-American -Amer woman born in Section 8 housing, married to a composer born in a little small town in the Alps. Uh, it's a case of opposites attracting. Um, it's very interesting, though. Um, there's actually a New York Times article about their marriage and their relationship. His uh, his composition uh, output has increased since they married. Uh, so whatever kind of lifestyle they have, it's definitely helped his music. Um, he he uh, actually wrote a piece called "I Can't Breathe." So when I first saw that. I figure, well, maybe it's got something to do with bondage or S and M, but actually, it's uh, dedicated to Eric Garner, uh, the black individual who was killed by police um, when they used an um, unauthorized hold on his throat. Um, I believe he said eleven different times, "I can't breathe." Um, it's you know, a tragic case of police uh, brutality in New York City. But the composition called I Can't Breathe is uh, for a trumpet solo. I've heard it's a 14-minute piece. I've heard bits and pieces of it. It sounds really interesting. Um, I mean, I'll, I'm dying. I'll probably pick that up if I can, if it's been recorded somewhere. I'm not sure if it has yet. Um, the other composer on here that I really love is John Cage. Uh, it, he they do an earlier piece. He doesn't. Uh, Marino does an earlier piece called "Music Walk" from 1958, which involves the use of radios, um, other auxiliary sound making machineries, and and, and a piano. Um, that's more of a typical typical old style cage piece. The other piece um, is titled "One" uh, in 1988 87. John Cage started writing a series of, he called them number pieces. One is the first one, up to 108 maybe. Um, 108 is uh, when he gets to the hundreds, and the pieces for orchestra. The, the, the a number tells you how many uh, performers are there. So one means there's one performer. 108, of course, there's 108 members of the orchestra to, to do that piece title 108. I actually have um, a piece called 101, um, which does not feature a conductor. Uh, John Cage said you can use the conductor in rehearsals, but in the live performance, um, you shouldn't have a conductor. It's kind of a nod to uh, democracy. Um, and John Cage was very interested, you know, and the musician's place in society, in, this, in society itself. Um, I'm going to read another great quote that I, that I found found from John Cage. Um, I think he 
said this maybe in the late 50s. I must find a way to let people be free without becoming foolish so that their freedom will make them noble. Great concept. He said, my problem, problems have become social rather than musical. Um, so he's, you know, he's really concerned about the place of art, an artist in society and society itself. So you, every time you listen to John Cage, um, you have to think of more than just music. He's, he, uh, he's a great deep thinker. Um, a lot of conceptual things were involved in his pieces, but um, you know he always thinks about issues like that too. That most most composers take for granted or don't even consider. Uh, but the piece one is uh, again, um, it's good that you know it's, it's like an Eric Satie, very slow. Each note is you know chosen carefully. It, it involves the use of time brackets. Um, you know, it's his his notation uh, is you know it's open to interpretation on that piece, especially. Um, but it's, it's a very you know very well done piece, uh, meditative. Uh, and like I said, every note just hangs in the air, and you can hear all, all the uh, after effects and the and the uh, sustained sounds that fade away until another sound appears, with slight little pauses in between. Sometimes you forget what you just heard, or then you or you remember it, but you don't know if it's how it's related to the next thing you're going to hear. That's that's an interesting part of his music too. Silence. Um, but the, uh, our composer on here that I really want to stress uh, today is uh, Alvin Lucier. Um, I learned about him from his piece called "I Am Sitting in a Room." Uh, which I don't want to talk about too much now. I don't take up too much time. That's probably one of his most well-known pieces. Um, he's also, he's more interested in the phenomenon of sound, not just music as you think of music. Um, he's more like a scientist when it comes to sound. Uh, there's two pieces on here uh, on the CD. I'm going to talk about the title track, uh, Nothing is Real. Uh, I think it was 1990, around that time, a uh, Japanese player, uh, a piano player, Aki Takahashi, was approached by a record label to do something involving the music of the Beatles. So what she decided to do is to contact some of her, her composer friends and ask them to, to uh, reinterpret a Beatles song for her to play. Um, John Cage participated in that also. Uh, Alvin, Alvin Curran, another Alvin who I love, he participated in that. I, I think there's actually two volumes, volume one and two. Um, I never saw them anywhere in the store. Uh, I think it's on the East World label. They're very hard to get. Um, and, and she might have done more Beatles type stuff, the Aki, uh, Aki Takahashi. Um, I'm not too sure about that, but it's, it's kind of difficult to find those two. I don't know why, but it is. Um, but when she approached Alvin Lucier to do a piece for the Beatles catalog, he said to her, well, I love the Beatles. I don't know uh, what song to pick. And she said, well, why don't you do Strawberry Fields Forever? And he asked her, why, why that particular song? She said, well, the words, nothing is real, kind of reminds me of your music. And he laughed and said, actually, my music is real. <laughs> if anything, that's what it is, real. You know, it's got that scientific approach to it. So and I, I know what he means. His music is not anything but real. Um, and he doesn't hide his technique. He lets you know what he's going to do ahead of time. Uh, so you know, that, that's more of a scientific uh, thing. Most people try to hide their process, um, but he's up, very upfront about that. He, he tells you exactly what he's going to do, and he does it. Um, but anyway, the piece "Nothing Is Real" uh, consists of he he uh, reinterprets uh, 
strawberry feel. He creates fragments of a, of a melody. You play that on a piano, and on top of the piano, you have a teapot with a wire going in here with a built-in microphone on the inside of the teapot. And so what the, the first four or five minutes of the composition on the piano, you play these fragments that are rearranged from the uh, song Strawberry Feels Forever. Um, and there's also an amplifier, there's a microphone on the piano amplifying the teapot. So for the second half of the composition, after the piano player stops playing the piano, uh, you hit the play button on, on your tape recorder or DAT recorder. Um, so now the, the, the speaker's inside the teapot, and you lift the lid like this, and by doing so, you change the resonance, so it's like a ghost-like sound coming from the speaker that was installed in this teapot. So you can, you know, play with this lid, or, or you can, you, if, when you raise it up and down, it also creates a different resonance. Um, so that, that's a very cool concept. Um, and actually, Alvin Lucier years ago approached uh, engineers and asked them um, if this was possible. Picture this as the auditorium that people sit in. And this is the roof of the auditorium. And of course, he wanted to have performers inside the auditorium playing, and he wanted to somehow lift the roof off the auditorium with a crane and change the residents of the entire auditorium. But of course, that was cost prohibitive. But so Lucia thinks of this not as a teapot, but as an auditorium, and you're lifting the roof, not the lid. So I think that's pretty cool too. But uh, yeah, Alvin Lucier, um, anything by him is worth purchasing. Uh, he does work with oscillators, um, any kind of just very interesting, like a scientific approach to music making. Uh, lately, for the past maybe 10 years or 20 years, he's actually doing more compositions with just instruments. Uh, and he's becoming more popular and popular on, um, you know, in, in our concert halls. They're actually playing a lot of the stuff along with, say, Mozart and, uh, you know, Gershwin or whatever. So he's becoming well-known again with a new generation of listeners and players. So, yeah, check out Alvin Lucier. Um, but this whole entire CD is, is worth listening to. Marino Fabetti is a fantastic piano player. Uh, a lot of music critics are calling him the Glenn Gould of this century. So that's a very, you know, uh, the, our critics adore him. And uh, I think everybody out there will definitely enjoy this CD in particular. And uh, you can tell by the front of the image um, that it's user-friendly. It's not too threatening. Uh, you know, it's, so I think it's a good place for people to start listening to modern classical music. Okay, guys, have a great night and be careful.